Welcome to the Voice of Power broadcast with Gary Atkins, pastor of Willing Vessels Christian Center in King, North Carolina. In a postmodern culture, Pastor Atkins preaches an old-fashioned message under a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, pointing men and women to the truth of Scripture and freedom found in Jesus Christ. Pastor Atkins believes the body of Christ has a voice, and when we declare Jesus is Lord, we have a voice of power. Here's a recent message from the Tabernacle of Willing Vessels Christian Center. I've got a capstone message here that I want to give you this morning, and it's not going to be very long, but uh, this is what's on my heart, and then we're going to leave it be, and we're going to move forward in Christ. Uh, but I want to read from Psalm 33, and I want to read one verse, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people he chose for his inheritance. Can I tell you that nothing just happens? God has a directive. He has a plan that will be fulfilled in human history. Every nation that has ever risen to power, it was because God planned and preordained that they would rise to power. And that's the only reason it happened, including the United States of America. And I believe that God chose America to be a light to the world for some 200 plus years to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that today. In fact, I want to read to you some quotes. Our first president, General George Washington, listen to what he said. While we are zealously performing the duties of good citizens and soldiers, we certainly ought not to be inattentive to the higher duties of religion to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. Listen to John Adams, the second president of the United States and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He said, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Every member would be obliged in conscience to temperance, frugality, and industry, to justice, kindness, and charity toward his fellow man, and to piety, love, reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be in America. Listen to the third president, Thomas Jefferson, and the drafter and signer of the Declaration of Independence. God who gave us life gave us liberty, and can... The liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis. A conviction in the mind of the people that these liberties are the gift of God. That they are not to be violated, but with his wrath. Indeed, he said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Amen. Listen to John Hancock, the first signer the Declaration of Independence. Resistance to tyranny becomes the Christian and social duty of each individual. Continue steadfast, he said, and with a proper sense of your dependence on God, nobly defend those rights which heaven gave and no man ought to take from us. Listen to Patrick Henry, another ratifier of the Constitution. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that the great nation was founded, not by religionists, but by Christians. Did you hear that? And not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship in America. Now that's our founding fathers. That was their foundation. That was their belief in the providence of God, ordained by God, to establish a nation that we call the United States of America. Amen. Now, America, the greatest nation on this blue marble planet. Why? I believe because the founders had it in their heart, ordained by God, to say this would be one nation under God. You believe that? Shout yes. Yes. As we witness the inauguration of the 46th President of the United States, many believe there was fraud, Cheating and deception. 
We see a group in America that would desire to silence another group. If you are a right-wing conservative Christian, you are labeled a racist bigot who is full of hate, and you must be silenced. Censory of social media, suppression of businessmen who are openly conservative Christians, persecuting anybody with uh, any faith who would say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Cancel culture is really and truly canceling God. 74 million people voted biblical values. A stance against pro-choice murder. And in that 74 million, I believe there is a church. There is a remnant of believers. We do not have a fight between right and left, but a fight against God in America. Some would ask, why would God allow this to happen? And my answer to you is that God did not allow it to happen. You did. I did. The church did not capitalize on the past four years. A president that stood behind the Christian evangelical more than any president in history. A president that lifted up the nation of Israel by placing our embassy in Jerusalem. We did not capitalize. It's our fault. President that was a backbone of liberty, safety, peace, and prosperity for America. So what do we do? How do we as Christians respond to what we feel is a major political injustice? Number one, we remember that God is sovereign and that he is in complete control with a perfect plan. Secondly, I want you to remember, shout remember. And I want you to turn to Matthew 16. I want to read this text, which I believe is the bedrock of the gospel of Christ in the New Testament. Jesus having a conversation with his disciples, and he asks them a question. I want you to see the response to that question. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he said, who do you say that I am? Can I tell you that that is the most important question that you could ever ask yourself? In fact, it's the most important question that he's asking you today beyond the scope of time when the apostle were asked this question. You're being asked the question today. Who do you, you watching, who do you say Jesus Christ is? Not where you stand on abortion rights and where you stand with same-sex marriage or the economy, but where do you stand on who you say Jesus Christ is? America founded upon the fact that the gospel was the light and the providence that would establish a nation that would call God the Lord, saying, in God we trust. Now, it's a far cry today, but as I told you, I believe in that 74 million plus that there is a church and a remnant that has to ask the world once again, who do you say Jesus Christ is? So I began with you this morning. Who do you say that he is? Listen to what Peter said. I love this. Verse 16, Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this was not revealed by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, can I, let me say this. In order for you to be able to say that, that he is Lord, that he is the Son of God, that to believe that he died for you, that he lived for you, died for you, that he resurrected for you, in order for you to truly say that and believe it, the Lord has to reveal it to you. 
He has to pull the mask of the flesh off. He has to pull the blinders off of your eyes. And He has to reveal to you that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. But let me just declare to you that people will not say that unless they hear a preacher. Romans chapter 10 tells us how will they hear if we do not tell them. How can we tell them if there are no preachers? Today I'm telling you, you are a preacher. You are an evangelist to your family, to your co-workers, to all those who are around you. And you have an obligation to preach the gospel. So Sunday school is going to be a wonderful thing to tell people how to witness for Christ. And if you don't show up, shame on you. Because that is an opportunity for you to get gifted in the way you can present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or you can be lazy like you've been the past four years and just watch ungodliness and unrighteousness rule and reign in America. I'm telling you, it's your fault. And you have to do your part to tell people Jesus Christ is the only hope and answer. Oh, yes. He said in verse 18, I tell you the truth, that you are Peter, and on this rock, everybody shout rock. I wish I had rocks to hand out this morning to remind you about this message. Boy, that would have been a good illustration, wouldn't it? I always think of these things while I'm preaching, you know. All right. Now, the Catholic Church, in many ways, have taken this passage, and they've developed a whole theology and ideology around the one they call the Pope, a descendant of Peter, who is the representation of Jesus Christ upon the earth, so much so that they bury them in the Vatican. Well, they don't bury them. They put them on display. Did you know that? That they lie in state in a see-through glass coffin. These popes with wax over their body. Some of them have brass over their body. Relegated to the person of Christ. But I believe that Scripture, when we read this passage, we need to read it through the eyes of Jesus. And I believe that Scripture doesn't give us every detail of what happened on that day. But I can only imagine that when he was looking at Peter, I believe he was saying, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And upon this rock, I believe he pointed at himself, upon this rock, I will build my church. And what did he say? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Petra Peter means rock. What was the rock? It was his confession of faith, saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. But make no mistake about it. The rock is Christ Jesus. And I believe America was founded upon the rock. I believe it was founded upon the value and the principle that Jesus Christ is Lord and the gospel will prevail. Believe what you want to. Worship who you want to. But in the end, if God has ordained you to eternal life, there's nothing you can do to resist it. There's nothing you can do to walk away from it because if He chose you, you will be a living stone. (laughs) In fact, listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. He said, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, see, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, precious, And chosen. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Christ is that rock. He is that living stone upon which we are the stones built upon him. He is the foundation. So if America, if there's any hope for America, I can promise you that it is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And it starts with you. Who do you say that he is? 
Is he first in your life? Is he first in your heart? Is he first in your thoughts? Is he first in your plans? You have to ask yourself that question today. Uh, Now to you who believe, verse 7, 1 Peter 2, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. When Jesus came to the earth, the Jews rejected him as the Messiah. He was a stumbling stone. They fell all over it. He could not be the Messiah. He's going to die on a cross. He's a lowly man from Nazareth. But when he comes back again, Zechariah tells us they're going to call him the capstone. Hallelujah. Upon which the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, is built. Jesus Christ. Verse, the end of verse number eight. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. That's a powerful verse right there. Destined to disobey. Now, I don't want to get into a debate about election and predestination. That would be a good Sunday school topic there. But let me just tell you, like I told you earlier, unless he reveals himself to you, you cannot be saved. You will never wake up one morning and say, you know what, I think I want to be born again. You know what, I think I'll quit sinning, I want to be saved. Nope. None of you did that. And nobody ever will. It takes Christ's Holy Spirit to convict you, open up your heart, and give you the measure of faith to be saved. So when you pray for your lost loved ones, don't pray, God, I hope they make good decisions. Nope. Pray, God, get a hold of their heart. Convict their heart by your Holy Spirit. Pull the blinders off of their eyes and show them that you are Lord because they will not make good decisions. They will make decisions that will destroy their lives just like you did and just like you have. And it takes the grace and mercy of God to make you a living stone. But the fact that you're here this morning, the fact that you hear my words, the fact that you're watching is evidence enough for me that you are the chosen of God. And I'm telling you, do not allow election or predestination to leave you out. Let it bring you in. And just say yes to Jesus Christ and you can become a predetermined living stone built into a spiritual house in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Uh, Verse 9, but you are a chosen people, chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. When you think about a rock, I want you to think about the totality of Scripture. Think about when Moses brought Israel out of Egypt. How God helped them get into this place called the wilderness. With no McDonald's, no Burger King on every corner. No 7-Eleven hadn't been created. Walmart was just in the beginning stages. No food, no water. And they said, we're thirsty, pastor. And he goes before the Lord and he says, you smite that rock. What happened? Water come gushing out of that rock. Picture of Christ, the rock who would be smitten and afflicted. But from that would come living water of the Holy Spirit. So that when you say yes to the rock, oh hallelujah. (laughs) When you say yes to the rock, living water begins to well up on the inside of you. And I think about what Jesus said in John 7, 38, 39. When he stood in the last day, the great day of the feast, and he cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me, as the Scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That wasn't the first time Moses had an incident where a rock was involved. In fact, he told the Lord, he says, I want to see your glory. And what did the Lord say to him? Well, tell you what, 
You just hide over here in the cleft of the rock. What was the cleft of the rock? It's Jesus. You can't see the glory of God until you're in Christ. You can't see the power of God until you're in Christ. You cannot see God move in your life until you say yes to the rock. Jesus Christ. America will never prosper until it puts its eyes as a majority on Jesus Christ. The government will never flourish until there are more men and women in government saying yes to Christ and who are living stones than deceitful and deceptive liars. Will never happen. But there is hope. But it starts with you and I. Who do you say he is? He was a stumbling stone to Israel. Daniel, go with me. I want to close with this, then I want to pray. Daniel chapter 2. Look with me. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel was a blessed individual in that he was able to see and witness the history of humanity. He was able to see the history of human government throughout the ages. From the time he was living all the way till the end when Christ returns. Not only the first time, but the second time. Now think about this for a moment and read with me. Daniel chapter 2 verse 31. You looked, O king, there before you stood a large statue. He's helping interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. An enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, representing the Babylonian empire, who in 586 B.C. took over the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. And they ruled and reigned. They kidnapped the people, took them back to Babylon. They left some of the older ones in Jerusalem. That's the head of gold. It did happen. In the chest and arms of silver, representing the Medo-Persian Empire, that would overthrow the Babylonian Empire. And the Medo-Persians would actually allow the Jewish people to go back with men like Nehemiah and Ezra and rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. He saw this before it happened. And its belly and thighs of bronze, representing the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, who would conquer the known world. Daniel's seeing history play out before it ever happens. He wasn't like some of those guys you've heard in past months who gave us prophecies. Daniel actually saw and heard from God. That's why you trust this and not this, right? Haven't I told you that before? Okay. It's legs of iron representing the Roman Empire, which was the empire during the time of Christ's birth and his death. It's feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay representing the revived Roman Empire that will be the empire of the Antichrist that is yet to come. Now we can look back in history and we can see where Daniel was right. That means we can also look to the future and know that Daniel is going to be right. While you were watching, verse 34, a rock. Everybody shout rock. There he is again. The foundation. The bedrock, if you will. <laughs> Hallelujah. Was cut out, but not by human hands. This won't be a government that is started by humans, by you and I as people. This will not be a government that is of this world. Amen. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. It will overthrow the Antichrist regime and government. Then the iron and clay, the bronze, the silver and gold were broken to pieces all the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. When Christ comes to set up his kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, all of these past nations and kingdoms, including America, there will not be a single trace of what man has built. 
But the rock, everybody shout the rock, the rock. that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. The rock, the cliff of the rock, the rock in the wilderness, the rock of stumbling, the capstone, the chief cornerstone, the rock of confession that he is the son of the living God is the only hope and the only foundation for America. And it's the only foundation for your life. If you're watching, the only foundation for you, the only place to start is with Jesus Christ. In fact, he told Peter in Matthew 16 and verse 19, I have given you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What are the keys? The key is Christ. The key is the authority of his name. The key is this. If thou confess with thine own mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with his mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the answer this morning. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You receive it today. Bow your heads all over this building. Father, I stand before you and I know that you are the only hope. The only hope for this nation, the only hope for me. Jesus, you are the only hope for the people this morning. And may we boldly declare as people of Willing Vessels Christian Center, may we declare with our whole heart that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the good shepherd, your son. Jesus is the door through which we enter salvation. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the living water. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Today, we ask you, if you're watching, pray this with me, would you? If you're listening, pray this. We ask you, Lord, as we stand here today, we confess, I am a sinner. I need you, Jesus. And today, I believe with my heart, I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And today, I boldly declare in this great nation that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Amen. I sure hope you prayed that prayer believing that Jesus has forgiven you of your sin and that he has transformed your life from this moment forward. And I'm so glad that you've decided to listen to the Voice of Power broadcast. And we pray that it has been a blessing to you. If so, we would encourage you to consider giving a financial donation to help the Voice of Power stay on the air. You can give in three ways. The simplest way to give would be through text message by simply texting a dollar amount to 336-747-3336 and following the instructions. And also you can go to the website at voiceofpower.org and click on the give link and it will take you step by step on how to give financially to the Voice of Power. And thirdly, you can give by mail, P.O. Box 2439, King, North Carolina, 27021. And once again, we're delighted that you've decided to listen to the Voice of Power broadcast and tune in next week at the same time. And I pray that the words of your mouth, the meditations of your heart would be acceptable in his sight, for he is your strength and your redeemer. <laughs>